Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So when you look at these scriptures, how many of you are going, oh man, what kind of message is this one going to be? The book of Romans has been involved in every great spiritual awakening in the history of the church. And this chapter and these sets of verses are very important and they are key to understanding the rest of the book. Because Paul is going to make a point here. And the point is that all are under sin. And that because all are under sin, all need a Savior. And because none of us have a righteousness within us that is enough to have God accept us, then we need a righteousness that comes from another place. And Paul is now giving you the foundation of why we need a righteousness that doesn't come from in us, that comes from outside of us. Again, I would like to invite everyone to the Sabbath School class. We are going through the book of Galatians. And again, the book of Galatians is another book that has been instrumental in all of the spiritual awakenings in the history of the church. So these two books, Galatians and Romans, go hand in hand. The Sabbath school class we had this morning was fantastic. Amen. Amen. Those of you who missed it, you really missed a blessing, a really good class on what the gospel is. Yeah. And listen, the importance of why you need to continue to come is the class ended on bringing out that within the Adventist church, there's multitudes of gospels being preached. What's the right one? The right one is the gospel that is found here in the book of Romans. It's also found in the book of Galatians. If you do not come, how will you learn? It's available to you, but the choice is yours. For the next 12 weeks, 12 weeks, you are going to get the privilege and the opportunity to hear messages from God in such a way that even a child can understand it. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, that's not an easy thing to do, okay? Especially with a book that contains some of the deep theological issues that are contained in the book of Galatians. And as we start to look at the book of Romans, last week we looked at chapter 1, and I'd like to conclude what we started last week by reading these notes that I got, they come from Jack Square. So realize that. When you see me looking down, I'm reading his notes. So everything that we need in the plan of salvation is found in this book. That's the book of Romans. It is a difficult book because he's writing not to scholars, but he's writing to people who thought so differently than our people today in the 21st century. But the book of Romans, is it still, does it still speak to us today? Amen. Does it have truth that we as God's remnant need to hear? Yes. So keep your Bibles open to Romans chapter 1. And let's look at verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why is he not ashamed? He's not ashamed because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17, and this is a foundational text. Mark it, underline it, go home and study it. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Yeah. 
So everything that we need in the plan of salvation is found in this book of Romans. As I said, it's a difficult book because he's writing not to scholars, but he's writing to people who thought so differently than we think today. You know, God brought this message to us, Seventh-day Adventists, over a hundred years ago. We are still struggling with it. We have to have committees and we have to have seminars to try to get together to see what this message is. The devil doesn't want us to know this message, and he has had tremendous success in keeping us in darkness. As we go to the book of Romans, I hope that we will see clearly this wonderful message of righteousness by faith and Christ our righteousness. You hear those terms, and they've been thrown up for over a century, but most people today have no idea what they actually mean. What does it actually mean? Christ, our righteousness. What is righteousness by faith? And what does that have to do with God raising up this movement to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus Christ? And brothers and sisters, as we continue to go through this book, and as you continue to study in the book of Galatians, it will become clear. And you will hear the true gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. As we go to the book of Romans, I hope that we will see clearly this wonderful message. Because as I read Ellen G. White, she says that our churches are dying because of a need on preaching on one topic. Do you know what that topic is? Righteousness by faith. Why are churches dying? Because they're not hearing this message. Amen. Righteousness by faith. Faith. She also makes the statement that in the light of the 1888 message, she says that it is the duty of God's people. Who are you? <laughs> it is your duty. What's God telling you with that statement? Is he giving you homework to do? Yes. It is the duty of God's people to search the truth. To remove the error. How will you ever be able to discern truth from error if you don't actually take the time to study it? Brothers and sisters, again, I'm telling you that the Sabbath school class is that we're going to be going through. You will have the opportunity to make the distinction between truth and error. The choice is yours. The church is bringing it to you. All we ask is that you come. It is the duty of God's people to search the truth, to remove the error. When this is done, she says, one truth. One truth will prevail, and one subject will swallow up every other. Do you know what that subject is? Christ, our righteousness. Christ, our righteousness. Do you struggle with sin? <laughs> well, I'm glad that there was... Quite a few that said yes. Because I'm going to be honest with you, I struggle with it not just on a daily basis, sometimes it's on an hourly basis. But what I have come to learn in 30 years of walking with Christ is that it's not I, the Christ that's in me. It is Christ and the indwelling of His Spirit that gives me any victory over this flesh. I know this flesh, I know it well. And I'm sick and tired of it. When Christ made me a new creation, what I was hoping for is that that would happen that quick. And you know what? It did happen that quick. The problem is, is this flesh was still here. And it still had a battle with that. But I can tell you honestly that when I, every time I've reached out in faith, to Christ. He's never failed me. Amen. Amen. Ever. So we make this battle between the spirit and the flesh. And that's not just a daily battle. Sometimes it's a minute by minute battle. And the spirit of prophecy tells us that some have grown tired in this battle. Some have grown weary and they want to give up. But the Bible says, he who 
what? Endures, perseveres to the end. So brothers and sisters, never, never think that this walk with Christ is going to be easy in a bed of roses. That's not what we're called for. Do you know why that's not what we're called for? Because this struggle, this battle, is the thing that God uses to best keep us humble, to keep us in a state of needing Him, and hopefully it continues to drive us to our knees at the foot of the cross to say again, it is not I, it is Christ. So Paul says again in Romans 17 that for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Then we read, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now look at the structure of this verse. Do you think he put this the way he did on purpose, that he uses the structure that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, here's the first one, ungodliness and then unrighteousness. Do you think that was done on purpose? And the answer to that question is yes. And this is what you need to understand when you look at the wrath of God. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. The wrath of God. Now, I grew up in Catholicism and I was taught the wrath of God. Not in a correct way, but I always feared the wrath of God. And I always knew when I did something wrong that that was coming. And it took, it took over a decade to start to understand what the wrath of God really is. And it took over a decade, and I still struggle with it today, what my standing is in the sight of God. I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, there was a man that I had the privilege of meeting many, many years ago who was the first one that I heard about the 1888 message. I was in the church for years, never heard about it at all. But this was 1988, a hundred year anniversary of the message that Jones and Wagner brought. And for almost five years, I never even heard of those guys. I never heard of uh, the 1888 message. Righteousness by faith, outside of what I heard from other Protestant churches. And this man did a slide presentation on the nature of Christ. And when I saw this slide presentation, and I read his scripture, and the quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy, and listened to his presentation, it broke my heart. It's the first time I clearly saw what Jesus Christ actually did for me. And I started to grasp who I was in Christ. And I had to struggle with the fact that I came into a church that was supposed to be God's remnant. And I was a legalist and I was taught legalism and I was teaching legalism. And that broke my heart. And as I started to be a leader in the church and I started to talk with people and have them talk with me, I started to realize just how, how, they had, they had no surety, they had no confidence. I met a man who his salvation was based on whether he repented of every single sin that he actually did. It's like, dude, what happens if you forget one? Yeah. You're done. It's like, brother, you realize that you sin against people and you may never even know. And that's just your outside sin. What happens in your head when it's your motive? It's because when I was a Catholic, I understood the Ten Commandments. We were taught that. But it was an outside thing, don't do this, don't do that, and then you're good. 
But what I come to understand through studying the Bible was God is interested in your heart, your motive. What is your motive behind this? And I found out that I could do really good things for really bad motives. That's why my righteousness is as filthy rags. So nothing that I did would bring me into a right relationship with God. And I met a lot of Adventists who felt the same way. And it's like, <laughs> what are you hoping in? And in the end, it's, well, I'm hoping that my law keeping is going to make God love me. And for years, it's like, wow, man, I can't live up to that standard. Because if this is about me, I'm lost. Because I know me. And God knows me even better than me. Listen to this presentation. And we were at a seminar down at uh, Pine Lakes Retreat. And so that whole weekend, I got to hear multiple presentations. And RJ's was the last one. And it, like I said, it, it was the most beautiful presentation of the nature of Christ, the gospel, and my surety in Christ that I've ever heard prior to that. to talk to anyone on why have I never heard this before? And he gave me some books to read. And I got to work with him for a number of years in the Deland Church. And I started to actually grasp what my salvation is based on and who it comes from. And through the years and through more study and listening to people <laughs> who have mm -hmm. such a depth of knowledge and a real relationship with Jesus Christ, <laughs> what Christ has done for us and what he continues to do for me on a day-to-day -day basis. There is nothing that this world can offer me that can ever, ever come close to what that's worth. So brothers and sisters, you have to ask yourself when you leave here, where's your focus at? Where's your priorities set on? Or what is your priority set on? Is it the things of this world? Because they are going to burn up. And they're going to disappear. And the only thing that's going to be left is the gold of the righteousness of Christ that's living in you. Or else you're going to be all dross. And what happens to drops when it's set to flame? So as we continue to study this chapter 1, Paul is making a foundation for the rest of the entire book. And if you miss out on this foundation, the rest of the book's not going to make sense. So let's continue to go through chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is what? Manifest. What's that word manifest mean? It's plain. It can be seen. Right? There's evidence. So, men are without excuse. And he's making a foundation here. All right? Humans are without excuse because what can be known of God can be seen by what He has created. Not only that, but God has placed it in our minds that there is a God. Why do you think religion is in every culture of every part of this world? It may not be true religion, but for some reason, we as human beings feel compelled to worship something. Right? That's what Paul is talking about here. Because what may, 
what may be known of God, this is verse 19, is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that what? Men are without excuse. Look at nature. That will speak to you volumes about the God that created nature. But we want to suppress the truth of God, and so we say there is no God. All this happened by chance. Does that make the truth any less truthful? No. Let all men be liars, but God is still true. Right? And Paul will go on to say that. For they are without excuse, verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. Nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. And brothers and sisters, that's the day and age that we live in. Humanity has become futile in its thoughts. And there's so much confusion out there. And it doesn't have to be that way. God has given us His Word. And if we would just study that Word, God will illuminate our minds with His truth. Amen? Amen. They became foolish in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became what? Ooh. Listen, don't be in that category. Don't get to the last part of your life and find out I have been a fool all my life. <laughs> Verse 23, change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies amongst themselves. You go all the way through this, God starts to list what happens when you turn away from God, when you don't allow the knowledge of God to enter into your heart, we become defiled and debased. <laughs> and we become unclean and unrighteous. Now, the world says our problem is unrighteousness, that we do evil things. The world says, given enough time, we'll grow out of that. The problem isn't unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is a symptom. The problem is what Paul listed first in this passage, and that is ungodliness. When you turn away from God, then all these things fall in its train. The problem with the world is ungodliness. God has raised this church up to proclaim a message to prepare people to give their hearts back to God. Amen. To put away the sin, to allow the Holy Spirit to clean them, purify them, and make them ready for Christ to come back. So that goes all the way to the end of that chapter. Then you get into chapter 2, and he still goes on. You realize that he spends almost three chapters discussing the sin problem. So if he spends this much time, don't you think it's an important aspect of the entire book of Romans? Yeah. Why? Because he wants to get you to understand that outside of Christ, you are a sinner, and there is nothing good in you. It doesn't matter whether you're one day old or whether you're 100 years old. We are fallen sinful creatures that are born with a corruptible nature. And that corruptible nature cannot be saved in and of itself. That corruptible nature needs to be saved by God and God alone. So listen. So he's making this point to show the Jews who say we have the law and we have Abraham and our lineage. And he's telling them, uh, you're in the same boat as these Gentiles that you despise. Because you have the law, but are you keeping the law? Those without the law, if they're not doing the law, then they're in the same boat you are. 
If you want to be saved by the law, then you have to keep the whole law. And if you don't keep the whole law, then you're lost. What you find out is you can't keep the law. What was the purpose of the law? He goes into chapter 3. What's the purpose of the law? The law is to show us sin. I would have never have known sin until I read the commandment that says, Thou shalt not covet. And when I read it, then I realized, well, I have all this inside of me. So he's going to go on in the book of Romans to mention a few laws, like the law of gravity. These laws are just like that, and they're inside of you. There's the law of the flesh, the law of the spirit. The question is, is which one are you walking? <laughs> so as I close, I would like to give a brief resume of what this doctrine of righteousness by faith, expounded in Romans, is all about. He's going to go through four major points. The first one is the doctrine of righteousness by faith. The doctrine of righteousness by faith is a truth that tells us that God has already. That word has, is that in past tense, present tense, or future tense? It's in the past tense. God has already. Remember this, it's a foundational point. So I want to remind you, it's in the past tense. He has already redeemed, not the elect like the Calvinists teach, but all mankind. In the holy history of His Son, Jesus Christ, so that legally, all humanity, and that's the unconditional good news of the Gospel, that all humanity in Christ has been reconciled to God. So legally, all humanity stands justified in Christ. For example, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, that's past tense. The original word is aorist, something that has already happened. We have already been blessed. So again, who has blessed us? Past tense, we've already been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is another text that you need to underline and remember. That in Christ you have already been blessed. And we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And this is what Paul will expand and expound on in the book of Romans. Two, he goes on to tell us this legal justification, while it may apply to all mankind, has to be made effective. All mankind will not go to heaven, not because God hasn't redeemed them, but because they have rejected this salvation. This legal justification is made effective by faith. This is why you are saved by faith. And it's the faith of Jesus, who your faith is in, that saves you. Okay? So this is why, again, every person here, if you are a born-again believer of Jesus Christ, Know who you are in Christ. Realize amen. that your salvation is taken care of. How can I ask you? How come nobody says amen when you say something like that? Brother, that, 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 that makes me excited because I'm born again. Amen. I believe in what you're saying. Thank you. But I have a voice. Amen. Everybody's like asleep. That's so listen, what the Bible says. Amen. This Hallelujah. should get you excited. Because yes. this is what Christ has done for you. Come on. Listen, if it doesn't get you excited... How about an amen? Amen. Okay, come on, church. Let's wake up. Christ come isn't on. going to come for a long time. Do you want him to come? Yes. He's waiting for his people to wake up. Yes. What's the problem with the church of Laodicea? Asleep. Wake up. Come on, brothers. <laughs> Sisters. Okay, so. God has already redeemed them, but because they have rejected this salvation, this legal justification is made effective by faith alone and nothing else. It isn't by faith plus going to church. It isn't by faith plus playing tithe. It isn't by faith plus keeping the Sabbath. Those are fruits Amen. of justification. Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen? Fruits of justification. The legal justification is made effective by faith alone. This means that the believer who accepts Christ, now listen to this carefully, 
is clothed with the perfect righteousness of Christ. Amen. And that is known as imputed <coughs> righteousness. Do I do anything for imputed righteousness? No. Mm. Imputed righteousness is God gives it to me. Yes. Boom! Great. You have it. God looks at me, he sees his son. As perfect as Jesus was, that's how perfect I am in Christ. Is that good news? Yes. Should that make you feel good? Yes. Well, that's why you don't feel good, because you think like I think, and you're thinking, you don't know what happened to me last week. You don't know what I did. God knows what you did. Is that right? Amen. God knew what you did 